Hey, gearheads, the 1960s were a defining era for American automobiles. Muscle cars and sleek designs ruled the roads, but not every car was a hit. Some were downright silly, bizarre, or just plain bad. Today, we're counting down the 15 worst and silliest American cars from the 1,960s models that made drivers scratch their heads, and not in a good way. Buckle up. The 1961 Dodge Dart Phoenix is a car that perfectly encapsulates the eccentric design choices of the early 1960s. It was Dodge's attempt to blend bold, futuristic styling with performance, but the result was a divisive vehicle that missed the mark in many ways. Aimed at standing out in the increasingly competitive American car market, the Phoenix certainly turned heads, just not always for the right reasons. At first glance, the most noticeable feature of the Dodge Dart Phoenix is its outrageous tail fins. In an era when tail fins were the epitome of automotive cool, Dodge took the trend to an extreme. The Phoenix's fins weren't just a stylistic flourish, they were enormous, towering over the back of the car in a way that dominated the design. While fins were meant to evoke sleekness and speed, the Phoenix fins came off as awkwardly oversized and detracted from the car's overall balance. But the fins weren't the only bold design choice. The Phoenix featured an unusual headlight placement, with its quad headlights stacked vertically rather than horizontally. This configuration was intended to give the car a futuristic, almost jet-age appearance. But instead, it contributed to a strangely bug-eyed front-end look that felt more bizarre than forward-thinking. Combined with the rounded, bulbous grille, the front of the Dart Phoenix looked out of sync with the rest of the car, further amplifying its design missteps. The body shape of the Dart Phoenix was equally odd. With its sloping roofline and stretch proportions, the car looked bulky and unbalanced, especially when compared to the more streamlined designs from competitors. The wide stance and exaggerated curves made it appear larger than it needed to be, without delivering the sportiness that Dodge had hoped to convey. The car was supposed to appeal to those looking for a dynamic and stylish ride, but its heavy-handed design cues made it feel more like a caricature of the era's styling trends. Mechanically, the Dodge Dart Phoenix wasn't entirely lacking. It offered a variety of engines, including the powerful 383 cubic inch V8, which gave it some muscle under the hood. However, even the respectable performance couldn't distract from the aesthetic issues that plagued the car. Buyers who may have appreciated its speed and power were often put off by its unconventional looks, which made it a tough sell in the showroom. Inside, the Phoenix did offer some modern conveniences for its time, but its interior design suffered from the same lack of cohesion as its exterior. The dashboard featured quirky Jet Age-inspired elements that seemed at odds with the rest of the cabin's layout. The overall impression was that Dodge had tried too hard to be innovative without considering the practical aspects of design. It was a car that seemed to prioritize appearance over function, and even then, the appearance was polarizing. Critics at the time were divided on the Dart Phoenix. Some appreciated its attempt to break away from the conservative designs of the 1950s, while others saw it as a misguided experiment in automotive styling. The car's awkward proportions combined with its overly ambitious use of fins and headlights, made it a frequent target for ridicule. Rather than being seen as futuristic, the Phoenix looked like a relic from a retro-futuristic vision of the future that never quite materialized. In terms of sales, the Dodge Dart Phoenix didn't live up to the company's expectations. The bold styling choices that Dodge hoped would attract young, adventurous buyers instead alienated much of the car buying public. The early 1960s marked a shift toward more restrained and elegant designs, and the Phoenix's flamboyance felt out of step with the times. Over the years, the 1961 Dodge Dart Phoenix has become something of a curiosity in the classic car world. Its quirky design makes it a standout at car shows, but not necessarily in a good way. Enthusiasts who appreciate oddball cars from the past may find some charm in its weirdness but it's unlikely to ever be considered a design icon. Ultimately, the Dodge Dart Phoenix serves as a reminder of the risks automakers take when they push the boundaries of design. 
While it's commendable that Dodge tried to create something bold and unique, the Phoenix ended up as an example of how ambition can sometimes lead to unintended consequences. Its combination of strange proportions, excessive styling elements, and lack of cohesion doomed it to a place in automotive history as a well-intentioned but flawed experiment in futuristic design. The 1960 Edsel Ranger stands as a symbol of one of the most infamous failures in automotive history, the Ford Edsel brand. Launched with high hopes in 1958, the Edsel line was intended to fill a gap between Ford and Mercury, offering a mid-priced upscale option. However, the brand quickly became a cautionary tale of how market miscalculations, poor timing, and controversial design choices can doom even the most ambitious ventures. By the time the 1960 Edsel Ranger was introduced, the Edsel brand was already in free fall. The Ranger was one of the last models produced under the Edsel name, and while it was intended to breathe new life into the brand, it only confirmed the Edsel's place as a commercial disaster. The Edsel's decline was rapid, and the Ranger's uninspired design and controversial styling cues did little to help. The most defining and divisive feature of the Edsel line was its horse collar grill, a vertical oval shape that resembled an old-fashioned horse bridle. It was meant to set the Edsel apart from other cars on the road and give it a distinct, upscale look. Unfortunately, this feature was widely ridiculed, and it became a key reason why the car was seen as unattractive and out of place, especially as the automotive industry was moving towards sleeker, more modern designs. By 1960, even Edsel's designers were aware of the negative reception, and they toned down the grill's design. But by then, the damage to the brand's reputation was already done. The 1960 Edsel Ranger was a far cry from the bold, innovative vehicle Ford had once promised. While earlier Edsel models were known for having distinctive, albeit polarizing features, the 1960 Ranger seemed stripped of any personality. Its design was much more conventional, perhaps in an effort to win back buyers who had been turned off by the earlier models. However, in doing so, the car lost what little identity it had left. The sleek, futuristic designs of competitors like Chevrolet and Ford's own models made the Ranger look outdated and bland by comparison. Mechanically, the Edsel Ranger wasn't necessarily a bad car, but it wasn't remarkable either. It came with several engine options, including the 292 cubic inch V8, which provided decent power. However, these engines were already available in other Ford models, making the Ranger feel like little more than a rebadged Ford with a tarnished name. Ford had hoped that the Ranger would appeal to buyers looking for performance and reliability. But the Edsel's reputation for quality control issues from its early models still lingered. By 1960, the Edsel brand was fighting against more than just an unattractive design. The car was also a victim of poor timing. Launched during a recession, the Edsel entered a market where buyers were becoming more cost-conscious, opting for smaller, more economical cars rather than the large, extravagant vehicles that the Edsel aimed to be. The brand was marketed as a premium vehicle, but was perceived as overpriced for what it offered. Additionally, Ford's marketing for the Edsel was confusing and often overhyped, setting expectations that the car simply couldn't meet. The public, already skeptical of the Edsel after its botched debut, was not impressed by the 1960 Ranger's half-hearted attempt to salvage the brand. The sales figures reflect the Edsel Ranger's failure to resonate with the market. In 1960, only 2,846 Edsels were produced, a far cry from the initial projections Ford had made when they launched the brand. This number includes all Edsel models for the year, not just the Ranger, highlighting just how far the brand had fallen. Despite Ford's massive investment in the Edsel program, an estimated $250 million, the car's poor reception made it impossible for the brand to recover. The Edsel name became synonymous with failure, and the Ranger was its final chapter. The 1960 Edsel Ranger is remembered today not for what it was, but for what it symbolized. The end of one of the most spectacular failures in automotive history, while many cars have flopped over the years, few have done so with the same high-profile collapse as the Edsel. The failure of the Edsel brand, culminating in the underwhelming Ranger, serves as a textbook example of how poor marketing, misreading consumer desires, and overambitious design can lead to disaster. 
Today, the Edsel has achieved something of a cult status. Collectors who appreciate oddball cars from history may seek out the 1960 Ranger as a conversation piece, but its historical significance as a flop is what defines its legacy. Ford's misadventures with the Edsel continue to be studied in business and marketing circles, offering valuable lessons in how even the most well-funded and hyped ventures can go awry. For all its faults, the Edsel, and the Ranger in particular, remains a fascinating chapter in the annals of American automotive history. The AMC Rambler, particularly models from the 1960s, may have been practical and reliable, but it was far from an exciting vehicle. While American Motors Corporation, AMC, positioned the Rambler as an economical and practical alternative to the big gas-guzzling sedans of the time, its boxy, uninspired design made it an unappealing option for many drivers who sought a bit more flair in their vehicles. Dubbed by some as a refrigerator on wheels, the Rambler's aesthetic was a reflection of AMC's focus on functionality and efficiency over style or performance. AMC had built its reputation on producing small, efficient cars, particularly during the 1950s and 60s, when many American manufacturers were focusing on larger, more luxurious models. The Rambler was designed to appeal to the cost-conscious consumer, someone looking for a basic, no-frills vehicle that would get them from point A to point B without breaking the bank. While this approach resonated with a segment of the market, it also meant that the Rambler sacrificed much in terms of style, performance, and excitement. The design of the Rambler was simple and utilitarian, with sharp lines, a squared-off roof, and flat surfaces that made it look more like an appliance than an automobile. While other car makers were embracing sleek, futuristic designs with curves, chrome, and eye-catching features, the Rambler remained stubbornly plain. Its boxy shape did little to attract younger buyers who were drawn to the more aggressive muscle cars or the luxurious sedans of the era. For many, the Rambler looked outdated and dull, even when it was brand new. Under the hood, the Rambler's engine options were equally underwhelming. Many models came with small, underpowered engines, often a straight six or four cylinder, which provided just enough power for basic transportation, but lacked any real punch. In an era where performance was becoming a selling point, especially with the rise of muscle cars like the Ford Mustang and Chevrolet Camaro, the Rambler's modest power output left it in the dust. Acceleration was sluggish, and driving one was more about practicality than enjoying the ride. The interior of the Rambler followed the same no-nonsense philosophy. With its bare-bones design and minimalist features, the interior felt more like an afterthought than a place to enjoy spending time. The seats were often plain bench designs with minimal padding, and the dashboard lacked the fancy dials or technological innovations seen in more expensive cars. In short, the interior was utilitarian at best, focusing on functionality rather than comfort or aesthetics. For a car that was designed to be affordable, these choices made sense, but they did nothing to enhance the driving experience. To its credit, the Rambler did have a strong reputation for reliability and fuel efficiency, which appealed to families and older drivers who prioritized practicality over excitement. The car was economical to own, and its simple mechanics made it relatively easy to maintain. For many, the Rambler was a sensible choice, especially during periods of economic uncertainty when fuel prices were rising. But while it earned points for dependability, it was never a car that inspired passion or pride of ownership. The AMC Rambler might be remembered fondly by some as a symbol of practical American motoring, but for many, it remains one of the dullest and most uninspiring cars of the 1960s. Its boxy design, lackluster engine, and bare-bones interior combined to create a car that felt out of place in an era when automotive design and performance were rapidly evolving. While it may have served its purpose as a budget-friendly option, the Rambler never captured the imagination of car enthusiasts, and today it is largely forgotten outside of collector circles and those with a soft spot for AMC's quirky legacy. The 1961 Mercury Comet was Ford's attempt to enter the rapidly growing market for compact, affordable cars, but it ended up being a bland and underwhelming addition to the lineup. Originally designed to be part of the Edsel brand, the Comet was repurposed under the Mercury name after the Edsel's spectacular failure. 
While it was intended to be a practical, budget-friendly vehicle for the masses, the Comet struggled with its uninspired design, awkward proportions, and lackluster performance, making it a largely forgettable entry in the early 1960s automotive landscape. In terms of design, the 1961 Comet had a rather dull, utilitarian appearance. Its awkward proportions were the result of being stretched out to fit Mercury's lineup, leaving it stuck somewhere between a compact and mid-sized car without excelling in either category. The front grille was fairly plain, lacking the flair or innovation seen in more popular cars of the time, while the elongated tail fins seemed out of place for the era, giving the car a dated look just as automakers were moving away from excessive styling. The Comet lacked the sleek lines and sporty appeal of competitors like the Chevrolet Corvair or the Volkswagen Beetle, making it difficult to attract buyers who were looking for something more eye-catching or stylish. The interior of the Comet was similarly underwhelming. While it provided adequate space for passengers and luggage, the interior design was basic at best. It lacked the premium touches one might expect from a Mercury model, as it was more closely aligned with Ford's economy offerings. Hard, plain seats and a no-frills dashboard did little to enhance the driving experience, and the car's overall aesthetic felt cheap and dated, even for a vehicle designed to be affordable. It was clear that the focus was on cutting costs, and this showed in the quality of materials used throughout the cabin. On the performance side, the 1961 Mercury Comet didn't fare much better. Equipped with a small 144 cubic inch straight six engine that produced around 90 horsepower, the car was sluggish, especially when compared to other compact cars of the time. Acceleration was slow, and the Comet struggled to keep pace with traffic, making it feel underpowered for anything beyond city driving. For a car meant to appeal to the growing market of compact, efficient vehicles, its lack of performance was a significant drawback. It wasn't particularly fuel efficient either, which was a missed opportunity in a market segment that was becoming increasingly focused on economy. Driving the Comet wasn't much fun either. The car's handling was mediocre, with vague steering and an uninspiring suspension system that made for a bumpy, uncomfortable ride on anything but the smoothest roads. While it may have been positioned as a practical, everyday car, the driving experience left much to be desired, particularly when compared to competitors that were pushing the boundaries of what compact cars could offer in terms of both performance and enjoyment. Despite its failings, the Comet wasn't a complete disaster for Ford. It sold reasonably well in the early 1960s, largely because of its affordability and practical size. However, the lack of excitement or innovation meant that it struggled to stand out in a crowded market. The Comet did manage to stick around for several more years, going through various redesigns and engine upgrades that eventually made it a more respectable offering. But the 1961 model remains a relatively unmemorable chapter in the history of compact American cars. In the end, the 1961 Mercury Comet represents a missed opportunity. While it was positioned to meet the growing demand for compact, economical cars, its bland design, lackluster performance, and uninspired driving experience left it trailing behind more innovative competitors. It wasn't a complete failure, but it wasn't a success either. And today it stands as a reminder that not every car designed to be affordable and practical ends up being appealing. The Studebaker Wagoneer, introduced in 1963, was an ambitious attempt at innovation in the station wagon segment. Its most notable feature was the sliding rear roof panel, which allowed for the transportation of taller cargo that wouldn't typically fit in a conventional station wagon. This concept was ahead of its time, and while it could have been a game changer for families and utility-minded buyers, the execution of this unique design was riddled with flaws, ultimately leading to the vehicle's downfall. The idea behind the Wagoneer's sliding roof was simple. Give owners the ability to carry large items like refrigerators or tall pieces of furniture without having to resort to using a trailer or truck. With the rear roof panel retracted, the wagon transformed into something akin to a pickup, providing extra versatility in a family-friendly vehicle. It was a clever solution to the growing need for more adaptable and multi-purpose vehicles in the 1960s. But unfortunately, that's where the praise for the Wagoneer often ended. One of the biggest issues with the sliding roof mechanism was that it wasn't properly sealed. 
Many owners quickly discovered that the roof leaked when it rained, turning the cargo area into a small swimming pool during wet weather. The leakage problem was so widespread that it became one of the defining traits of the Wagoneer, and many owners were forced to either tolerate a soggy rear seat or take their vehicles in for repairs that didn't always solve the problem. Beyond the leaking roof, the sliding mechanism itself wasn't particularly reliable. Owners reported that the roof panel could get stuck or jammed, making it difficult to open or close. Over time, the tracks that guided the panel would wear down, and the overall design just wasn't built to withstand the test of regular use. This lack of durability left many Wagoneer owners frustrated, as what should have been a useful feature became more of a headache. Design-wise, the Studebaker Wagoneer struggled to find a balance between utility and aesthetic appeal. While the retractable roof was innovative, the overall look of the car didn't resonate with buyers. It had a boxy, utilitarian appearance that lacked the sleek lines and attractive styling that buyers were increasingly looking for in family vehicles. In a decade when car design was evolving toward more aerodynamic and visually engaging forms, the Wagoneer's awkward proportions and unusual rear roofline made it stand out, but not in a good way. Mechanically, the Wagoneer suffered from the same issues that plagued many of Studebaker's cars in its final years. Reliability was a significant problem, with many models experiencing frequent mechanical breakdowns, particularly with the transmission and engine components. The car wasn't particularly powerful either, and its performance lagged behind competitors like the Ford Country Squire and Chevrolet Impala Wagon, both of which offered more horsepower and smoother handling. The Wagoneer's practicality was also called into question. While the sliding roof was meant to provide additional versatility, it came at the cost of structural rigidity. With the roof panel open, the car's body became less stable, which could lead to more pronounced flexing during driving, especially when loaded with cargo. This impacted handling and made the car feel less secure on the road, particularly when compared to more conventional station wagons with fixed roofs. Despite these problems, Studebaker attempted to address some of the Wagoneer's issues in subsequent model years. In 1964, the company offered a fixed roof option for buyers who didn't need the sliding panel, but by then, the Wagoneer's reputation had already been tarnished by the leaking roof and mechanical failures. Studebaker was also nearing the end of its operations, and the Wagoneer wasn't enough to turn the company's fortunes around. Sales for the Wagoneer were disappointing, and it never gained the widespread popularity that Studebaker had hoped for. The unconventional design may have been too niche for the market, and the poor execution only further alienated potential buyers. In the end, the Wagoneer became more of an automotive curiosity than a success story, and it remains an oddball in the annals of station wagon history. Today, the Studebaker Wagoneer is remembered for its ambition and innovation, but also for the many flaws that prevented it from becoming a practical, reliable vehicle. It's a case of a great idea that was let down by poor engineering and execution, and it serves as a reminder that sometimes, even the boldest concepts can fall short when they don't meet the needs of everyday drivers. While it may be a rare sight on the road today, the Wagoneer has earned its place in automotive lore as a cautionary tale of innovation gone awry. The 1960 Plymouth Valiant was Chrysler's bold attempt to break into the growing compact car market, but its unconventional design made it stand out for all the wrong reasons. Aimed at offering an affordable and practical alternative for American families, the Valiant's bizarre appearance became one of its most defining and most criticized features. Designed by renowned stylist Virgil Exner, the car embodied Chrysler's forward-look aesthetic, but in the case of the Valiant, it felt more like a step backward in style. At first glance, the 1960 Valiant had a design that was difficult to categorize. The car's grille was particularly odd, resembling a fish-like face with its wide, oddly-shaped opening. The grille was large and sat prominently at the front, surrounded by oversized headlights that seemed disproportionate to the rest of the vehicle's body. These headlights, coupled with the sloping hood and curved fenders, gave the car a somewhat cartoonish appearance, leading some critics to liken it to a fish out of water. The design certainly didn't follow the smooth, sleek lines that many other automakers were embracing in the early 1960s. Another strange design choice was the pronounced body slope that made the car appear to be leaning forward. The rear end was sloped as well, 
giving the car a hunchback profile that further contributed to its awkward aesthetics. The large rounded tail fins, though not as dramatic as those on other Plymouth models, looked out of place on a compact car and combined with the weird proportions, the Valiant seemed unsure of what it was trying to be. Though it was meant to be a compact economy car, the Valiant still had traces of the excessive design features typical of larger, more luxurious cars from the late 1950s, which didn't suit its intended market or size. This mix of compact practicality and exaggerated styling cues left many buyers confused and uninterested. In terms of performance, the Valiant did offer some respectable features for a compact car of its era. Under the hood, it was equipped with Chrysler's new Slant 6 engine, which was known for its durability and efficiency. The engine, angled at 30 degrees to reduce the car's height, delivered a solid balance of power and fuel economy, and it was actually one of the Valiant's redeeming features. The engine design was innovative and ahead of its time, offering 101 horsepower in its initial configuration, which was decent for an economy car. However, the styling and performance were mismatched, as buyers weren't expecting a quirky design when looking for a basic, affordable compact. Competitors like the Ford Falcon and Chevrolet Corvair, which were also released around the same time, offered more cohesive and appealing designs without compromising on affordability. The Falcon, in particular, became a huge success because of its straightforward, no-nonsense styling, something the Valiant lacked. Meanwhile, the Corvair, while also controversial in some aspects, had a more modern and streamlined look. The interior of the Valiant didn't do much to make up for its exterior oddities. It was functional but plain, with basic materials that didn't provide much in the way of comfort or luxury. The dashboard was relatively simple, but the layout wasn't particularly intuitive, and the overall cabin felt cramped compared to some of its competitors. Though it was designed to be practical and affordable, the Valiant lacked the refinement and attention to detail that many buyers were starting to expect, even in economy cars. Sales of the 1960 Valiant weren't as strong as Plymouth had hoped, largely because its design alienated many potential buyers. The car simply didn't resonate with the public in the way Chrysler had anticipated. And, while it did have some loyal fans, it couldn't keep up with the sleeker, more stylish competitors that dominated the compact car segment. The Valiant became more of an oddity in the market, rather than the standout success that Chrysler had envisioned. The car did evolve over the years, with later models becoming more refined and less polarizing in appearance. However, the 1960 Valiant remains a reminder of how important styling can be when introducing a new model to the market, especially in an era when cars were as much about making a statement as they were about transportation. In the end, the 1960 Plymouth Valiant was affordable and practical, but its fish-like grille, awkward proportions, and oversized headlights made it a design misstep in a decade where cars were expected to be more than just utilitarian. While it wasn't a complete failure in terms of sales, its strange appearance and lack of performance compared to its competitors meant that it never achieved the widespread success Plymouth had hoped for, leaving it more of a quirky footnote in automotive history. The 1962 Dodge Polara 500 is often remembered as one of Dodge's more bizarre creations from an era marked by bold, experimental automotive design. As Dodge's full-size entry into the early 1960s market, the Polara 500 was supposed to capture the excitement of American performance cars while blending style and comfort. However, the unusual design choices made the car stand out in all the wrong ways, leaving it as an oddity rather than a success in Dodge's lineup. The front end of the 1962 Polara 500 was one of its most controversial aspects. The car featured slanted headlights that gave the front a strange, almost squinting appearance. The headlights were set into canted pods that angled inward, which was an unusual design trend at the time, but didn't quite work for the Polara's overall aesthetic. The grille wide and flat only emphasized the awkwardness of the front end, making the Polara look more alien than aerodynamic. These elements created a disjointed look that clashed with the sleek, smooth styling that other American cars of the early 1960s were starting to adopt. Moving toward the rear of the car, the design didn't improve. The bulbous rear end added to the car's offbeat appearance. The rear fenders were exaggerated, giving the car an almost bloated look, 
with taillights that seemed oversized and out of place. The overall profile of the Polara 500 didn't have the flow or balance that cars from the same era typically achieved. Instead of presenting a sleek, modern image, the Polara's odd combination of bulbous forms and sharp angles made it appear as though the designers couldn't decide which direction to take. The Polara 500's performance was also lackluster for a car that was meant to evoke excitement. While Dodge had a reputation for building powerful, performance-oriented vehicles, the Polara 500 didn't live up to that standard in its early models. Equipped with a range of engine options, including a 318 cubic inch V8 and the more powerful 383 cubic inch V8, the Polara 500 had potential on paper, but the driving experience didn't reflect the same level of excitement. Its handling was uninspiring, with a heavy, unresponsive feel that made it less enjoyable to drive, especially compared to its more nimble competitors like the Chevrolet Impala and Ford Galaxy. One of the reasons for its lackluster handling was the Polara's large, unwieldy size. As a full-size car, it was designed to offer plenty of interior space and comfort, but this came at the cost of agility. The car's weight distribution and suspension setup didn't lend themselves well to sharp cornering or sporty driving, and it often felt sluggish and disconnected from the road. In an era when performance cars were becoming more refined, the Polara 500's bulky handling put it at a disadvantage. While the interior of the 1962 Polara 500 was well-appointed with plush seats and chrome detailing typical of the period, it didn't do enough to distract from the car's other shortcomings. Buyers who wanted a mix of style and substance were left underwhelmed by both the strange exterior and the underwhelming performance. Although the Polara 500 was meant to be a sportier, more upscale version of the standard Polara, it failed to strike the right balance between form and function. The sales figures reflected the public's lukewarm reception to the Polara 500's design. Buyers were simply not convinced by the odd mix of styling elements that didn't seem to mesh together cohesively. At a time when car design was moving toward more streamlined, graceful forms, the Polara 500 felt like a relic of an earlier, more exaggerated design philosophy that no longer resonated with the American public. As a result, the Polara 500 didn't achieve the commercial success Dodge had hoped for, and it was soon overshadowed by more popular models that were easier on the eyes and more exciting to drive. Despite its shortcomings, the 1962 Dodge Polara 500 has gained a certain cult following among automotive enthusiasts who appreciate its quirky design and rarity. The car's distinctiveness, while a disadvantage in the early 1960s, has made it an interesting footnote in Dodge's history. Collectors who seek out unusual cars often view the Polara 500 as a fascinating example of how design risks can sometimes go too far, making it a coveted oddball in the world of classic cars. Ultimately, the 1962 Dodge Polara 500 is remembered as a car that was a little too ahead of its time in the wrong ways. Its alien-like front end, awkward proportions, and uninspiring handling made it a commercial disappointment in its day, but its bold, unconventional design has earned it a niche spot in the history of American automotive design. While it may not have been a success, the Polara 500 is a reminder of an era when automakers were willing to take risks, sometimes with strange and unexpected results. The AMC Rebel, introduced in the late 1960s, was AMC's attempt to offer a mid-sized family car with a hint of sportiness. Unfortunately, it fell short of delivering on either front. The Rebel was meant to compete in the increasingly crowded mid-size car market, but despite AMC's ambitions, it failed to stand out in terms of design, performance, or overall appeal. One of the biggest issues with the Rebel was its clunky and uninspired design. While many of its competitors were embracing sleek, aerodynamic lines and modern styling, the Rebel's look felt dated. The car had a boxy, upright shape, which didn't evoke the sporty image AMC had hoped for. Its bulky front end and slab-sided profile made it look heavier than it was. And while some models had more aggressive features, like hood scoops and racing stripes, these felt like superficial attempts to give the car some excitement. Inside, the Rebel's interior was basic and utilitarian, lacking the refinement that many of its competitors were beginning to offer. 
While it was spacious enough for a family, the materials felt cheap and the overall design was bland. There were few creature comforts and AMC's cost-cutting measures were apparent throughout. This lack of interior sophistication made the car feel even more out of touch, especially at a time when customers were expecting more luxury and comfort from their family cars. From a performance perspective, the AMC Rebel was equally disappointing. While it did offer a variety of engine options, including a V8, it never quite lived up to the potential of its muscle car aspirations. The Rebel's standard models were underpowered, particularly compared to other mid-sized cars of the time, like the Chevrolet Chevelle or Ford Torino. Even the higher performance Rebel models, such as the Rebel Machine, struggled to keep pace with their muscle car counterparts due to poor handling and weight distribution. The car lacked the responsiveness and acceleration that were becoming the hallmark of high-performance cars of the era. The suspension and ride quality were also subpar. The Rebel's handling felt sluggish, especially in corners or at higher speeds, making it far from sporty. Many owners found the car to be unrefined on the road, with a stiff, uncomfortable ride that didn't match its family car credentials. It felt more like a heavy, lumbering machine than the nimble, sporty vehicle that AMC had hoped to create. In terms of engine performance, the base models of the Rebel were equipped with engines that simply didn't offer enough power. The entry-level six-cylinder models struggled with acceleration and had a hard time keeping up with traffic, while the V8 models, though more powerful, were still a step behind the competition. The car was also notoriously inefficient, consuming more fuel than many of its rivals without delivering the kind of performance that might justify the cost. The Rebel's styling didn't help matters either. While AMC tried to give the car a sense of visual flair, it often came across as awkward or forced. The Rebel lacked the flowing lines and dynamic shapes that characterized successful cars of the late 1960s and early 1970s. Instead, it appeared blocky and disproportionate with design cues that seemed out of sync with the trends of the time. The grille and headlight design were particularly odd, lacking the boldness of other muscle cars or the sleekness of more refined family sedans. In many ways, it felt like the Rebel was stuck between trying to be too many things at once, a muscle car, a family car, and a budget-friendly option, without excelling at any of them. This identity crisis was at the heart of the AMC Rebel's failure. By trying to appeal to too many different types of buyers, it ended up satisfying very few. Families looking for a comfortable, reliable vehicle found better options elsewhere, while enthusiasts seeking high performance were left underwhelmed by the Rebel's lack of power and sluggish handling. Even those looking for a stylish ride were likely to pass on the Rebel, given its awkward proportions and bland aesthetics. Ultimately, the AMC Rebel became one of the least memorable cars in the AMC lineup. While AMC had a reputation for creating innovative and quirky vehicles, the Rebel lacked both the innovation and the quirkiness that made cars like the AMC Javelin or the Pacer stand out. It wasn't bad enough to be infamous, but it wasn't good enough to be remembered fondly either. Its mediocre performance, uninspiring design, and lack of a clear identity led it to be overshadowed by its competitors. And today it remains a footnote in automotive history, a car that tried to be everything, but ended up being very little. In the context of mid-sized American cars of the late 1960s and early 1970s, the Rebel simply couldn't keep up. It was caught in a period when the muscle car craze was in full swing, and yet it didn't have the power or performance to compete. The Chevrolet Corvair, introduced in 1960, initially promised to be a revolutionary car, breaking away from the typical American design with its rear engine air-cooled layout. General Motors intended the Corvair to compete with European imports like the Volkswagen Beetle and Porsche 356, and it was heralded as a new direction for American compact cars. However, by the mid-1960s, the Corvair's reputation had plummeted due to serious safety concerns, particularly related to its handling. The Corvair's rear-engine design, while innovative for a mass-produced American car, led to a unique set of problems. The placement of the engine at the rear created a weight imbalance that made the car prone to oversteering, especially during sharp turns or sudden maneuvers. This was compounded by its swing axle suspension system in early models, 1960 to 1963. 
which unlike more advanced independent suspension setups, could cause the wheels to tuck under during cornering, leading to a loss of control. The combination of these design flaws resulted in numerous accidents, raising concerns about the car's overall stability. The Corvair's handling issues didn't immediately come to the forefront, but over time, drivers and automotive experts began to notice the car's tendency to skid and roll over under certain driving conditions. This handling problem was exacerbated by the recommended tire pressure specifications, which were unconventional. Chevrolet suggested running the rear tires at a significantly higher pressure than the front tires, but many owners, unfamiliar with this recommendation, maintained uniform tire pressure across all four wheels. This further increased the likelihood of accidents. The car's reputation took a dramatic downturn when consumer advocate Ralph Nader published his 1965 book, Unsafe at Any Speed, which famously highlighted the Corvair's flaws. In the first chapter, Nader specifically targeted the Corvair, calling it a prime example of automotive negligence. He argued that General Motors had put style and cost-saving measures ahead of safety. His critique was centered on the Corvair's unstable suspension and the dangers it posed to drivers. The book became a bestseller, and Nader's expose helped push automotive safety to the forefront of public consciousness, contributing to the establishment of new safety regulations for cars. Nader's criticism and the ensuing media storm cemented the Corvair's place in automotive history as one of the most infamous cars of the decade. Although GM made attempts to improve the car in its second generation, 1965 to 1969, including replacing the problematic swing axle suspension with a fully independent rear suspension, it was too late. The damage to the Corvair's reputation had already been done. Sales plummeted, and by 1969, GM discontinued the model. Despite its downfall, the Corvair had several redeeming qualities. Its design was praised for its sleek, European-inspired look, and it offered a more refined ride than many of its competitors. The car was also noted for its fuel efficiency and was one of the few American cars of its time to feature a turbocharged engine, which was ahead of its time in terms of performance options. However, these positive aspects were overshadowed by its safety concerns. The Corvair's legacy remains one of missed potential. While it could have been a game changer in the American automotive market, the handling issues and the ensuing public relations disaster turned it into a cautionary tale. The controversy surrounding the Corvair played a significant role in reshaping the auto industry, forcing car manufacturers to take safety more seriously and paving the way for modern automotive safety standards. In the end, the Chevrolet Corvair stands as a symbol of how poor engineering choices and corporate decisions can turn an innovative product into a historical failure. Its notoriety endures, largely thanks to Nader's advocacy, and it remains one of the most studied examples of automotive safety flaws in the 20th century. The 1963 Buick Riviera stands as one of the most audacious examples of 1960s American automotive design a car that epitomizes the era's fascination with grandeur and innovation. This model was not merely a vehicle, but a statement of excess and boldness, capturing the imagination of those who saw it as a pinnacle of luxurious design, while simultaneously drawing criticism from those who found its extravagance overwhelming. The design of the 1963 Riviera was a radical departure from the more restrained aesthetics of the early 1960s. The car's front end was dominated by an enormous chrome-heavy grille that stretched dramatically across its width. This grille was not just a visual centerpiece, but a functional element designed to enhance engine cooling. Its sheer size and elaborate detailing made the Riviera instantly recognizable, setting it apart from its contemporaries. For some, this grille was a bold and impressive feature that underscored the Riviera's luxury credentials. For others, it was an example of design excess that overshadowed the car's other qualities. Complementing the massive grille were the sharp angles and pronounced lines that defined the Riviera's body. The car featured a sculptural design with dramatic cuts and folds, giving it a sense of movement even when it was parked. These angular elements were a stark contrast to the more flowing, curvaceous lines of other vehicles from the period, adding to the Riviera's unique and somewhat controversial appearance. The sharpness of these angles, combined with the car's broad stance, gave the Riviera an almost aggressive look, which, while striking, 
also made it a polarizing figure among automotive enthusiasts and critics alike. The oversized body of the Riviera was another hallmark of its design. Its long, sweeping lines and wide proportions were intended to convey a sense of power and prestige. This size was not just about visual impact. It was a deliberate choice to enhance the car's presence on the road and to offer a spacious interior. However, the sheer bulk of the Riviera, combined with its bold design features, led some to view it as an emblem of excess. The car's large dimensions, while providing a commanding road presence, also contributed to its reputation for being unwieldy and overly extravagant. Underneath its striking exterior, the 1963 Riviera was equipped with a 401 cubic inch V8 engine, delivering a robust 325 horsepower. This powerful engine was a key component of Buick's strategy to blend luxury with high performance, ensuring that the Riviera was not only a visually stunning car, but also a thrilling one to drive. The engine's performance was matched by the car's advanced suspension system, which aimed to provide a smooth and responsive driving experience despite the car's size and weight. Inside, the Riviera continued to impress with its luxurious and thoughtfully designed cabin. The interior featured high-quality materials and an array of advanced features for its time. The dashboard was meticulously designed, and the car came equipped with power windows, a power-operated front seat, and an array of other comforts that underscored its luxury status. The interior layout and design were crafted to complement the car's bold exterior, offering a cohesive and refined driving experience. The 1963 Buick Riviera is remembered as a car that encapsulated the spirit of its era, one of bold experimentation and a desire to push the boundaries of design and performance. Its massive grille, sharp angles, and oversized body reflect a time when automotive manufacturers were eager to make bold statements and create vehicles that were as much about making a statement as they were about practicality or subtlety. While its design was not universally appreciated, the Riviera's place in automotive history is secure as a symbol of the opulence and innovation that characterized mid-century American cars. The Riviera's place in history is a testament to the ambitious spirit of its time, embodying both the allure and the excess of 1960s automotive design. It remains a notable example of how automotive design can push boundaries and provoke strong reactions, leaving a lasting impression on both the road and in the annals of automotive history. While the Chevelle SS remains a celebrated icon in the realm of American muscle cars, the 1965 Chevelle 300 Deluxe paints a contrasting picture of what happens when a legendary nameplate is applied to a more pedestrian model. Designed as a budget-friendly alternative to the high-performance Chevelle SS, the 300 Deluxe aimed to offer a more accessible entry point into the Chevelle family. However, instead of adding to the Chevelle's legacy, it often felt like a letdown, a stripped-down version that drained the essence of excitement from the brand. From a design perspective, the Chevelle 300 Deluxe was a study in minimalism, lacking the bold styling that made the SS such a head-turner. Where the SS boasted aggressive lines, a prominent grille, and sporty trim, the 300 Deluxe took a more subdued approach. Its exterior was functional but uninspired, featuring a simpler grille, fewer chrome accents, and a more conservative overall look. The sharp angles and dramatic features that characterized the SS were replaced with a smoother, more utilitarian design. While this made the 300 Deluxe suitable for everyday use, it also made it blend into the background, failing to capture the attention and admiration that the SS commanded. Under the hood, the contrast between the Chevelle 300 Deluxe and its sportier sibling was even more pronounced. The 300 Deluxe came equipped with base engine options that were designed more for economy than performance. Unlike the SS's powerful V8 engines that provided exhilarating acceleration and a thrilling driving experience, the 300 Deluxe featured smaller, less potent engines. This emphasis on fuel efficiency and cost savings came at the expense of excitement and power. The result was a vehicle that was reliable and practical, but lacked the zest and thrill that made the Chevelle SS a true performance icon. The interior of the 300 Deluxe reflected its focus on practicality rather than luxury. 
The cabin was designed with basic features and minimal frills, prioritizing function over comfort. Where the SS's interior offered a blend of sporty aesthetics and premium materials, the 300 Deluxe presented a more straightforward and utilitarian environment. The seats were functional but lacked the sporty bolstering of the SS, and the dashboard was simple, with fewer gauges and controls aimed at enhancing the driving experience. This no-nonsense approach meant that while the 300 Deluxe was adequate for daily driving, it lacked the refinement and engagement that enthusiasts might have hoped for. Driving the 1965 Chevelle 300 Deluxe was a different experience compared to its high-performance counterpart. The ride was comfortable but unremarkable, with handling that did not inspire the same level of enthusiasm as the SS. The driving dynamics were geared more towards everyday usability than spirited driving, making it a reliable vehicle for commuting and errands, but not particularly thrilling on a winding road or track. The lack of performance features and enhancements meant that the 300 Deluxe felt more like a standard family car than a member of the Chevelle family with a racing pedigree. In retrospect, the 1965 Chevelle 300 Deluxe represented a missed opportunity for Chevrolet. The brand had successfully created a high-performance muscle car with the SS, and the 300 Deluxe could have been a more affordable entry point that still retained some of that excitement and appeal. Instead, it emerged as a stripped-down model that failed to live up to the legacy of its more celebrated sibling. While it served its purpose as a practical and budget-friendly vehicle, it did not manage to capture the spirit or excitement that defined the Chevelle brand. In summary, the Chevelle 300 Deluxe stands as a reminder of how a nameplate known for its performance and flair can sometimes produce models that fall short of expectations. It is a testament to the challenges of balancing cost, practicality, and excitement within a single model. And while it may have met the needs of budget-conscious buyers, it remains a footnote in the larger story of the Chevelle's storied history. The 1966 Oldsmobile Toronado is a fascinating and ambitious chapter in automotive history. As one of the first American cars to feature a front-wheel drive system, the Toronado was heralded as a groundbreaking model that sought to redefine automotive design and performance. However, while its innovation was commendable, the execution of the concept faced several challenges that impacted both its driving experience and its overall appeal. The introduction of front-wheel drive in the Toronado marked a significant departure from the traditional rear-wheel drive layouts that had dominated American cars. This technological leap was aimed at improving traction and interior space, offering a glimpse into the future of automotive engineering. The Toronado's front-wheel drive system was intended to enhance the car's handling dynamics and provide a more spacious cabin by eliminating the need for a drive shaft running to the rear wheels. While these features were forward-thinking, they also introduced a range of complexities and challenges. One of the primary issues with the 1966 Toronado was its bulkiness. The car's substantial size, which was necessary to accommodate the front-wheel drive system and the large V8 engine, resulted in a vehicle that many drivers found difficult to handle. The Toronado was a heavy car, and its mass contributed to a driving experience that was less agile and more cumbersome than what was offered by its competitors. The car's handling characteristics were affected by its weight distribution and the novel drivetrain layout, leading to a driving experience that fell short of expectations. Aesthetic considerations were another area where the Toronado faced difficulties. The design, though innovative, was often criticized for its awkward appearance. The oversized wheel arches, a necessity for housing the new drivetrain, gave the car a disproportionate look that did not resonate with all buyers. The front grille, which was meant to emphasize the car's advanced engineering, was seen by some as an odd design element. Its unconventional shape and prominent placement were intended to convey a sense of technological sophistication, but instead, they contributed to a design that many found unappealing. The interior of the 1966 Toronado was another mixed aspect of the vehicle. While the front-wheel drive system allowed for a more spacious cabin, the overall layout and design did not fully capitalize on this advantage. The car's interior was spacious compared to many of its contemporaries, but the design and materials used were not always in line with the luxury aspirations of the model. The cabin lacked some of the refinement and quality that buyers expected from a high-end vehicle, 
and this discrepancy was noted by critics and owners alike. Performance-wise, the Toronado's front-wheel drive system was a double-edged sword. While it provided some benefits in terms of interior space and traction, it also introduced new challenges. The heavy front end of the vehicle, combined with the novel drivetrain, affected the car's acceleration and handling. The Toronado struggled to deliver the performance expected from a luxury car of its time, and the driving experience was marked by a lack of refinement and responsiveness. In terms of reliability, the Toronado also faced issues. The complexity of the front-wheel drive system, coupled with the car's overall design, led to mechanical problems that were not uncommon for early adopters of new technology. Owners reported various issues, including difficulties with the drivetrain and other components, which affected the car's long-term dependability. Despite these challenges, the 1966 Oldsmobile Toronado remains an important vehicle in automotive history. It represents a bold attempt to innovate and push the boundaries of automotive design, and it paved the way for future developments in front-wheel drive technology. The Toronado's introduction was a significant moment in the evolution of American cars. And while its execution may have fallen short in some areas, its impact on the industry cannot be denied. In summary, the 1966 Oldsmobile Toronado stands as a symbol of both ambition and the complexities of automotive innovation. It was a car that aimed to lead the way in front-wheel drive technology, but its bulky design, handling issues, and aesthetic missteps highlighted the difficulties of integrating new technologies into mainstream vehicles. The Toronado's legacy is one of pioneering spirit tempered by the realities of automotive development, and it serves as a reminder of the challenges faced by those who seek to push the boundaries of what is possible in car design and engineering. The tiny Nash Metropolitan, a distinctive automobile from the 1960s, remains a memorable piece of automotive history. While its compact size and charming design initially captured the imagination of many, the Metropolitan's shortcomings soon became apparent, revealing its limitations as a practical vehicle. At just over 10 feet in length, the Nash Metropolitan was one of the smallest cars available on American roads during its time. Its diminutive proportions gave it a quirky, endearing quality that made it stand out in a sea of larger, more robust vehicles. The car's design, characterized by its rounded edges and cheerful appearance, was intended to appeal to drivers looking for something different from the mainstream offerings of the era. However, the Metropolitan's small size came with significant drawbacks. One of the most glaring issues was its underpowered engine. Equipped with a modest 1.5-liter four-cylinder engine, the Metropolitan struggled to keep up with the demands of highway driving. Its performance was far from impressive, with acceleration that was sluggish and top speeds that left much to be desired. The car's lack of power made it ill-suited for anything beyond city driving, and it often struggled on the open road. In addition to its performance limitations, the Nash Metropolitan size made it impractical for many drivers. The car's compact dimensions, while providing excellent maneuverability in tight spaces, resulted in a cramped interior. With limited passenger and cargo space, the Metropolitan was far from ideal for families or long journeys. Its tiny footprint, while contributing to its unique charm, also meant that it was often viewed as a novelty rather than a serious contender in the automotive market. The Metropolitan's appeal was largely rooted in its novelty factor. Its small size and distinctive design made it a conversation piece, and it was frequently seen as a quirky alternative to more conventional vehicles. The car was often compared to a clown car due to its size and playful aesthetics, and while it certainly had its fans, it was not taken seriously by many drivers who preferred more practical and powerful options. The Nash Metropolitan also faced challenges in terms of build quality and overall durability. The car's lightweight construction, necessary to keep it within its compact size constraints, meant that it was more susceptible to wear and tear. Owners reported various issues with the car's mechanical components and overall longevity, further diminishing its appeal as a reliable daily driver. Despite these shortcomings, the Nash Metropolitan holds a special place in automotive history. Its unique design and the era in which it was produced contribute to its enduring appeal as a collectible and a symbol of 
1960s automotive experimentation. While it may not have achieved widespread success or practicality, the Metropolitan remains a charming reminder of a time when car manufacturers were exploring new and unconventional ideas. In conclusion, the Nash Metropolitan was a car that embodied both the potential and limitations of its era. Its small size and quirky design made it a standout in the automotive landscape. But its underpowered engine and impracticality for most drivers limited its success. The Metropolitan's place in automotive history is secured by its distinctive character and its role as a unique offering in the market, showcasing the creativity and experimentation that define the era. The 1964 Ford Thunderbird was an ambitious car designed to blend the prestige of the Thunderbird name with a new emphasis on luxury and comfort. However, despite its storied heritage and Ford's best efforts, this particular iteration of the T-Bird struggled to live up to expectations. What was intended to be a refined, high-end personal luxury vehicle ended up feeling oversized, awkwardly proportioned, and out of step with the sleek, performance-driven cars that dominated the mid-1960s market. From the outset, the 1964 Thunderbird was plagued by its size. As part of the fourth generation of Thunderbirds, this model saw a dramatic increase in its overall dimensions. Ford was aiming for a more comfortable, luxurious vehicle to appeal to buyers seeking a smooth, leisurely driving experience. But the result was a car that looked and felt too bulky. The Thunderbird had grown from its roots as a nimble, sporty car into something resembling a land yacht, a departure that alienated some of its traditional fan base. The car's larger size also made it harder to maneuver, especially in urban settings where smaller, more agile cars were becoming increasingly popular. Visually, the 1964 Thunderbird struggled to strike a balance between elegance and excess. The design featured sweeping lines, a long hood, a broad front end, but many critics felt these elements were overdone. The wide open mouth grille, meant to give the car a commanding presence, instead contributed to its ungainly look. The car's exaggerated tail fins, once a hallmark of 1950s American automotive design, had lost their charm by the mid-1960s, making the Thunderbird seem outdated compared to the sleeker, more modern designs coming from Europe and even some domestic rivals. The proportions of the car were another sticking point. While some luxury cars of the era embraced large, imposing designs, the Thunderbird's execution felt off balance. The long nose and short rear overhang created an unbalanced aesthetic, as though the car were stretched unnaturally. While earlier Thunderbirds had managed to fuse sportiness with luxury in a harmonious way, the 1964 model felt like it was trying too hard to be luxurious at the expense of good design. In an era when automotive design was trending toward clean lines and minimalist elegance, the Thunderbird's bulk and awkward silhouette made it look clumsy. Inside, the Thunderbird continued its struggle with identity. The interior was spacious, reflecting the car's increased size, but the styling and execution of its features left much to be desired. Ford had aimed to provide an upscale experience with plush seating and a dashboard packed with features, but the result was underwhelming. The interior design didn't feel cohesive or innovative, and while there were plenty of gadgets, they often felt tacked on rather than well integrated into the overall aesthetic. Compared to competitors like Cadillac and Lincoln, whose interiors embodied true luxury, the Thunderbird's cabin felt like a half-hearted attempt at sophistication. Comfort was a priority in the 1964 Thunderbird, and to be fair, it did deliver a smooth, quiet ride. However, this emphasis on comfort came at the expense of performance, which was a problem for a car with such a powerful legacy. Under the hood, the Thunderbird was equipped with a 390 cubic inch V8 engine, producing 300 horsepower. On paper, these numbers were impressive, but the car's weight and size dulled any sense of performance. The engine was more than adequate for cruising along highways, but it didn't provide the sharp, responsive driving experience that many buyers wanted. The handling was sluggish, and the car's size made it feel ponderous on winding roads or in tight city spaces. For those who had fallen in love with the earlier, sportier Thunderbirds, this model was a disappointment in terms of driving dynamics. Fuel economy was another area where the Thunderbird lagged behind. The car's large V8 engine, combined with its considerable heft, 
meant that it was a gas guzzler at a time when fuel efficiency was becoming more important to consumers. While this wasn't a deal breaker for buyers looking for luxury, it did add to the perception that the Thunderbird was a bloated, inefficient car. One of the most significant criticisms of the 1964 Thunderbird was that it lacked the distinctive charm and character that had made earlier models so beloved. The first-generation Thunderbird introduced in 1955 had been a groundbreaking car, blending sports car performance with luxury features in a way that captured the imagination of American buyers. And there you have it, the 15 worst and silliest American cars from the 1960s. While the 60s produced plenty of iconic vehicles, these models were design missteps or mechanical nightmares. Let us know which one you think deserves the title of the worst, and don't forget to subscribe for more car history and automotive fails.